the book of Galatians, the second chapter and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I think I have never but once in my life before attempted to talk on this verse. But I'm looking for your prophet this morning. This is Paul's testimony. It is a bit of beautiful type personal theology thrown into an epistle which is not so beautiful. You see one of the Galatians for the backsliding. But in verse 20 of chapter 2, he, he calls the little diamond to be placed. And we ignore the rest of the epistle and try to find out what the man of God meant. We're not taking it out of his context, we're simply acknowledging the fact that the context is too big to be dealt with. In any one sense. I am crucified with Christ, says the Apostle, and every version except the King James probably put that I have been crucified with Christ. And that is the meaning of it. I have been crucified with Christ. Now I want you to note before we attempt uh, to go into it further that it is a contradictory little verse with a number of contradictions in it. I am crucified. I have been crucified. Now that's a contradiction. Meaning that anybody who had been crucified wouldn't be there to tell about it. Either he had not been crucified and could talk, or he had been crucified, in which case he couldn't talk. But here is a man saying, I have been crucified, and it's still writing me down here, and so can talk. No one ever said, I have been hanged. Except, of course, if he were not in his right mind, we're talking about sane people. But no one ever said to a doctor, well, doctor, send to the undertaker, I have died. Because if he had not died, he wouldn't say he had died if he were in his right mind, and if he had died, he wouldn't be telling the doctor. And yet here is a man who says, I have been crucified. And that in itself is a contradiction. But granted now that by some wonder, a man could say, I have been crucified, as though he were speaking from the next world, back to this one, then he contradicts himself again by saying, nevertheless, I live. If he had been crucified, how then could he live? And says, I live, and then contradicts that, and says, yes, not I. And then down on the fourth line, he has the same kind of a Bible I have, he says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I who have been crucified and yet am alive and yet am not alive, I who am yet not I, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now I have deliberately accented the apparent contradictions here in this, not because I believe that there are any basic contradictions, but uh, I want you to see that you can't pass this verse over, just pass it over the way you do the Lord's Prayer in the 23rd Psalm. You can't do that. 
Noi primi in campione ora si giacciono in mente. E se primi in campione ora non ho lo vedmini. E se giacciono in mente, noi ora prendiamo la rara out in nord, in mio. I believe it means something. And I believe not only that it means something, but I believe that it can be made practical and workable and livable in this present world in the lives of all of us. Now he says, I have been crucified and fourteen times in each of those immediate verses around there, the word I, myself, and me are used. In five times the word I is used here. If that means anything, I don't know that it does. But the word I occurs here. He's not, he's not bashful about that I. We have a poor old brother in the society who was from years a missionary to China. And uh, he's a very learned old man, very cultured man, but he has a phobia for the word I is simply very not wounded. When he wants to talk about anything that happened in his missionary journey, he says one remembers when one was in China, one saw. And uh, that seems to me to be fair a little bit too far. I said about him good naturedly, and he would take it good naturedly, but we're friends. That if he'd been writing the 23rd Psalm, he would have said, The Lord is one shepherd, one shall not want. He maketh one to lie down in green pastures, he maketh one. Uh, well, that's not so good. Paul talking about I, and I believe there is a legitimate place and time for the use of the word I. Not somebody else, not generally. The man who bows his head and says, Lord, bless the missionaries, and all to whom we should pray, amen. He has been so general that God himself couldn't answer in prayer, I'm sure. But when we say I, we have tuned it down and tuned the point of it. Now I is the sum of total, my total individual being. And Christianity recognizes and tells the problem of I. Most of the shallow psychology religions of the day try to deal with the problem of I by dropping it around. But the Christianity will deal with the problem of I by disposing of it finally. And there are two eyes. There is the I which is found in well, two eyes found in every believer is the natural eye. And that's what Paul means when he said, uh, I, my natural self, I have been crucified. Then there is another I, and that is the new man, and that I now lives. So that there are two different I's here. I have been crucified, I live, and yet I who is crucified do not live, but I live in Christ, and Christ is in me. There's no contradiction, there's only a parent one, you see. Because there are two working I's. And uh, this I, which is the natural me, stands in the just anger of God. God can't stand it. Because it is the essence of everything that is anti-God. There are those who don't believe in the Antichrist or the possibility of there ever being an Antichrist, but putting aside the eschatology that is involved there, that we say simply that whatever does not go through the process of crucifixion and transmutation and the passing over into the new creation in Christ is Antichrist. We don't know it, and certainly we try to smooth it over, but all that which is not with Christ is against Christ. If you're not on my side, you're against me, and if you do not gather with me, you scatter abroad. This is the day of tolerance, when the whole wide world, sparked by the communists, who are the most intolerant people in the world, are preaching tolerance in order to break down all the borders of religion and embarrass American people with their social and racial problems. But uh, in spite of the fact that this is the day of tolerance, the most intolerant book in all the wide world is the Bible. And the most intolerant teacher that ever stood on his feet to address an audience was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. There's a vast difference between being tolerant and being charitable. 
Jesus Christ was so charitable that in his great heart he took in all the wide world and died for those that hated him. But he was so intolerant that he said, if you're not on my side, you're against me. If you do not believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. It was an either or drawn so tight and fine that it was either get over on the his side and live or stay over on the other side and perish in the most no middle ground. There's no twilight zone that could be his deep. No place in between. He said, and you've got the true religion and nobody else has. I said to a Lutheran pastor yesterday, I don't know how this sounds to you, brother, but as for me, the older I get, the less I care about denominations. The less I care about names and tags, and the more I see that there is a broad fellowship of spiritual people who know their God, regardless of what they call themselves. He quickly agreed with me, warmly agreed with me, and said he believed that was in the will of God, and that we knew each other by the, by the discernment of the Spirit when we met. Now that came from a Lutheran brother. Well, charitableness is one thing, charity, that is, to take in everybody, and that loves everybody, would, would die for everybody, that would give your life for anybody and everybody, that, uh, that believes in the humanity of everybody, and the dignity of everyone, and the right of everyone to his own opinion. That's charity. But tolerance is quite another matter. For me to say, well, Come and be saved if you want to, but if you don't want to, maybe there's another way. Believe on Jesus Christ if you will, but if you should not want to, possibly God will find a way for you, or you will find a way to God. That's not tolerance, that's power. Now, in this matter of I, pretend to deal with it. And it deals with it by an intolerance and final destruction. And he says, this I can't live. God deals with it. It's not all our proud life. And pronounce a stern condemnation upon it. And flatly with the truth is fully rejected in total. He says that this I, this, this, this rebellious I, this anti God I, is filled with sin. The essence of rebellion and disobedience and unbelief. This I, God, will have nothing to do with it. You see, there's two kinds of religions. I'm not talking about denominations. I'm talking about within the back and framework of Christianity. There's two kinds, the two traditions. One is that the Lord came in order to help me, help my eye, and uh, to take out the complexes and uh, the, the twists that uh, I got into because my mother told me when I was a baby, you know the old psychiatry stuff. Or the other position is that God, Jesus Christ, came to bring an end to self. Not, not to educate it and polish it, but put an end to it. Not to cultivate it and give it a love to Bach and Beethoven and Da Vinci. But to bring an end to it. Say, all right, now you've come so far, you stop here. Let's fire no further, you old eye. And in repentance and self-repudiation, the putting of myself out, I turn my back on my old self and refuse to go along with it anymore and desert the train. Come over onto the side of Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. Walk under the banner of the cross from that hour on. That disposes of the old self finally. And that's what baptism is supposed to mean that does it. Baptism is nothing but a bath to the average person. We have a bathroom back here, but it's nothing but a quick bit to the average person. Because they do not know what it means. They do not know that it's an outward visible symbol of something that is supposed to have taken place. The old self is repudiated and hooked away. Die. I have been crucified with Christ. Down and up and now I live. That can happen apart from water baptism of any mold. The water baptism is supposed to set that forth as a wedding ring, set forth the fact that you are married. 
Now, I hope that there will not be any attempt to synchronize and compromise these by mutual confessions. You say, well, now, why, why not be charitable and tolerant and take it all in? If uh, some people believe that the Lord came to help the old life and pack it up and uh, get a little elixir into it and give it a new jab of adrenaline, why, uh, let them believe it. Oh, don't argue with them. Let them believe it. They're, they're doing good. But I can't see it that way. And I do not believe that we ever ought to try to dovetail with the future Either Jesus Christ came to bring an end to self, start a new life, or he came to patch the self up. How did he come to do both? Hmm. Won't do it one way in your conference and another way in my conference. He doesn't like it all conference around the world regardless of what he calls. And then and women belong to his name. And incidentally, I read two letters this week. I wish you'd read them. I'll let you read them if you wish. You know who they're from? They're from a, uh, oh, what do they call this one? Trappist monk. Trappist monk. He's taking a vow of Pilate. That man isn't a Christian. God is well, spirit is well, Christian, and I'm not. You'd think John Wesley had written those letters. You'd think Luther had written those letters, or John Knox. Trappist monk. Don't ask me. Don't ask me, Mr. Cole, but how can you, and I don't explain. I don't know. I didn't get out of that old ground. Go out and get a Bible and begin to preach what he believes. I don't know. I only know he's down there taking a the vow of silence. Letting people one third as big as he is boss him around. But oh, what a glow of love he has for the person of Jesus, for redemption, for the cross, for the glory of the Lamb. For whatever conference you're in, it's all the same thing, brother, even if it's in a monastery. I wouldn't want to be in one. Now, don't go out and say, close it in favor of monasticism. I'm not. The Lord said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't say, go and hide in the bowels of the earth and pull a hole in Africa. I never believed in monasticism. Old Simeon Stylites, remember, went up on a pole 30 feet high and sat down on it and stayed there 30 years. One year for every foot he was off the ground. 30 years he stayed up there. The old lazy scoundrel, he should have come down out of that and gone and taken a bowl of soup to a widow or a, or a bottle of milk to a baby or given a New Testament to somebody that didn't know the truth. Up there, squat legged like a useless sailor, sitting 30 years, thinking that because he was 30 feet off the ground, he was near to death. Heaven, and if he's been down since I say that's tragic misunderstanding of everything. I don't know how I got into that, but I did. Now, the whole burden of the New Testament theology is that the old self is ruined completely. Its values are false, and its wisdom is questionable, and its good goodness, none at all. And the new self in Christ Jesus. The new man in Christ is all that must live. From now on, we must reckon ourselves to have died indeed unto sin, but be alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Now, the natural eye takes inventory, and what it requires and seeks and hopes to find, something that will cause it and help it to escape the past, sin, and the wrath of God, something that will make itself pleasing to God, Something that will make it sufficient to live, please, in God. Something that will enable it to do God's work satisfactorily. And something that maybe it is as important as any, that will enable it to develop to the fullest outreaches of the potentials of its nature. They're all created with a blueprint. And I suppose not very many ever build all over the blueprint. They just build a little hot in the middle, and maybe after a few years of hard work, get a little addition on it, and they're stretching the blueprint in all four directions. God made the blueprint. And we, as we build, never come out to the edge of the blueprint. Never roll it up and put it on the shelf and say, thank God, I've got the last wall up and the last arch raised and the last roof. Oh. I believe that the outworking of all the 
potentials of a man's mighty nature, all that he can do, all that he can think, all that he can dream and imagine and boom as a human, as a redeemed human. That if he has not found a way to let all those powers loose and receive those powers from God, he's not yet what he ought to be. Well, I think that ought to be added. That's what a man looks for in himself. Something that will enable him to live a full human life and a full Christian life, pleasing to God, escape from the past and face back to the future. What does he actually find when he looks in his own heart? Finds he's nothing. He finds he knows nothing. He finds he has nothing. He finds that he can do nothing. I preached commencement sermon at a college last two weeks ago, and I told them, among other things, that all the difference between an educated and uneducated man was this. If the educated man knows that there are more things he doesn't know than the educated, uneducated man. That's the main purpose of education is to show you more things you don't know and probably never will find out. The oracle declared that Socrates was the wisest man in Greece. And uh, Socrates explained the reason the oracle said it was that Socrates was the only man in Greece that knew he didn't know anything. He said, that's why they said I was right. Because I'm the only man in Greece that knows I don't know anything. All the rest don't know anything and think they do and are unwise for that reason. I know nothing and know it, and I'm wise for that reason. That was Socrates' explanation. I think he had his tongue in his teeth. But it sounds all right. So that's the stuff, your natural stuff. So who you say, but I'm a Swedish descent? Well, you're human. I'm a Dutch descent. I come from Nellie. Well, how nice. Sure, you. You say my German grandfather was a farm son, so nice, you see. It's your human, too. I'm a cross between English and German. And I'm human. It is Irishman, human. And it's Fire Hill from North Dakota, human. Or North Carolina. And they were all alike, but. Don't boast to me about your ancestors. I know who they are. And we're all alike. And it can be said of all of us, regardless of our racial strength, whether they be from Africa or India or from any of the Occidental countries, we're all alike. I am nothing. In myself, I know nothing. I have nothing I can do. And now the new eye takes inventory. What is the new Ah, my friends, the new eye has Christ. The new eye, the new person has Christ. He says, it is no longer the old ignorant, do nothing, know nothing, see nothing, have nothing person. He died when I believed in Christ. So now it's a new man in Christ Jesus the Lord. And now, I'm not ashamed to say I and afraid to say I. Because when I say I, I mean not I, but Christ living in me. And I mean the new man in Christ. You see, it says in Colossians 1, 22, Christ in you the hope of glory. In Ephesians 1, 6, accepted in the beloved. In Colossians 2, 10, you are complete in him. In Corinthians 1, 30, he has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So Jesus Christ is what we need. He has what we need. He knows what we need to know. And he can do in us, working in us that which is well pleasing in his sight. You say that rather, that rather rules me out then. Where's my ambition? Where's my thing? Where's my publicity? Uh, do I get a statue out of this? Or, or a name plate on the window? Or what do I get out of this? You get Christ and glory and fruitfulness and future and uh, the world to come whereof we speak. And the third the just man made perfect, and the Christ, and the blood of the everlasting covenant, and the innumerable company of the church of the firstborn, and the new Jerusalem. And before that, we get all the service on earth for mankind. That's what you get out of it. But God loves you too well to let you strut and boast. Hmm. 
and cultivate your egotism and feed your eye. You won't have that. Christ works in us to complete himself and make himself over in us. Uh, what a great Christianity we evangelicals have these days. We get criticized by the liberals and all we should have. And I don't blame them for letting criticize. They got all right. They haven't anything any better. But what a low bunch of unworthy people we evangelicals are. Daring to stand up on our feet and preach to intelligent audiences. That's the essence and final purpose and end of the cause of Christ is to save men from hell. How stupid can we get in still claims to be followers of Christ? The purpose of God is not to save men from hell. The purpose of God is to save, to save them unto Christ-likeness and to make them like God. And God will never be done with us until today when we shall see his face and his name shall be on our force. And we shall be like him and see him as he is. What a cheap, low-grade, across-the-counter, commercial kind of Christianity that says I was in debt. And Jesus came and paid my debt. Sure he did, but why if I emphasize that? But I was on my way to hell and Jesus stopped me and saved me. Sure he did, but that's not the big thing to emphasize. What do you to emphasize? That God has saved me, that to make me like his son. That his purpose in catching me in my wild race to hell, turning me around and renewing me, and bringing the old self to an end, and creating a new self within me, the purpose of God was that he might reproduce in me the beauty of his son. And no Christian is where he ought to be until that beauty of his son has been reproduced in the Christian life, his Christian life. Now that necessarily a question of degree. Certainly there never is a time when anybody can look in his own heart and say, Well, thank God I see it finished now. The Lord has signed the painting. The the profile, the, the beautiful picture has been painted. I see Jesus in myself. Nobody will say that. Nobody. Even though he be Christ like and God like, and charitable and full of full of love and peace and grace. Mercy, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness. He won't know it. He won't know it. He'll be ignorant of it, and he'll be pressing on, asking folks to pray for him, and reading his Bible with tears, and saying, Oh, God, I want to be like thy son. And God knows he's like his son somewhat. And the angels, I suppose, know it, and the people around him know it, but he doesn't know it. Humility never looks in on itself. Humility always looks out. Emerson said, The only eye that sees itself is blind. He said again, the eye is to see through, not not see, but see through. If my eye could suddenly become conscious of itself, I'd be a blind man. But I'm unconscious of my eye, I'm conscious of your face. The moment I'm no longer conscious of your face, but conscious only of my eye, I'm blind. Now, in practical operation, I try to be true by far. Practical operation... You must increase, but I must decrease. Less and less of me and more and more of Christ. That's the bitter cross, brother. That's the bitter cross. More and more of Christ, less and less of me. I get less and less in experience. Potentially and judicially, I was crucified with Christ. Now God wants to make it actual. And in actuality, it's not as simple as that. In actuality, it comes by degrees. Peace and power and fruitfulness will increase according as it's no longer I but Christ that lives in me. Now, what's it going to be? My way or Christ? Is it going to be my righteousness? No, Christ's righteousness. Is it going to be my honor and praise? No, Christ's honor and praise. Is it going to be my choice? No, Christ's choice. My plan? No, Christ's plan. The only time we hear this anymore is in hymnology. We sing about it and don't do a thing about it. Shut the book and write the man who looked in the mirror and forget what he looked like. Didn't say a woman did that, but a man did it. He looked in the mirror and forgot what he looked like, and that's the way we do it in him. 
We sing, oh, to be dead to myself, dear Lord, oh, to be lost in the shutter book and go have a soda. But I tell you, it must become operative. It must become practical. That which is objective to it must become subjective experience. Or else Christianity is a fox, a delusion. Curse always follows selfishness. Always. When it's I instead of Christ, ugliness. I told you sometime recently that the most beautiful, to me one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible was that one in the 90th Psalm. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. How wonderful the beauty of the Lord our God. But set in sharp contrast to the beauty of the Lord our God is the ugliness of I myself. An anonymous writer of the Germanica said, Nothing burns in hell but my knee, I and mine. That's the fuel of hell. How ugly it is. How unutterably ugly. What an ugly man Hitler was. Oh, he wasn't bad to look at. That hair down, that's what he say. I mean, as a state, he looked at anybody else more or less. But how ugly he was. How unutterably ugly. How ugly the Caligula and Nero. How ugly. How ugly is that man? Murder. A gangster. Ugly. Morally ugly. Because selfish. Self, that's just an extreme case, sir. You say, I'm not a Caligula, I'm not a Nero. I am not a Hitler. No, you're not yet. The Bible says, let him that is unholy be getting unholier still. They simply race to their degeneration faster than you have. Culture, education, 20th century, modern ways, don't you think, but the fall of Christianity keeps the world from going to hell as fast as it would otherwise. But we've all got it in us. Jakey said, I never heard of a sin that was ever committed that I didn't know that I had the seed of it in me. There never was a sin committed that you don't have the seed of it in you. As soon as God takes away the salt of preservation, we'll rock overnight. How ugly is self and how beautiful is the Lord our God. Dr. Tuckley, I certainly don't quote him as a Orthodox man, but he said something I appreciated. He said, My kingdom go is the necessary corollary to thy kingdom come. And yet we dare to pray every Sunday in this church, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What are we praying for? Maybe we'd better put in the a verse. Better, better put one in head of it a little bit and say, My kingdom go, thy kingdom come. Or his kingdom can never come till my kingdom go. And when I am no longer king of my life, you become king of my life. I am crucified. I have been crucified with Christ, said the dear old man of God. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, the Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live by the flesh I live for the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now I want to tell you something and then I'm finished. It's this. It's quite one thing to preach this, and it's quite something else to live. John Fowler, Johannes Fowler, the great German preacher, before Luther, one of the greatest preachers, an evangelical before his time, was a great preacher. And he could preach. Somebody came down from the country, Nicholas they called him, a farmer. Said, Doctor, I'd like to hear a sermon on the deeper life, on the, the spiritual life, union with Jesus. The old man said, All right, young boy, an old man. The doctor said, All right, Nicholas, I'll preach that sermon. Stick around, I'll preach it next Sunday. So next Sunday, he preached. At 26 points. 
tell us you ought to have seven. He had 26. It was a good sermon. I've read it. And I can underscore every line of it. It was a good sermon. The telling people how to pull away their sins and their selfishness and live under God and Christ Jesus. Great sermon. When it was over and the crowd at his first, Nicholas came slowly down the aisle. He said, Doctor, that was a great sermon. Thank you. Thank you. He said, That was just what I wanted to hear. I hadn't heard a sermon on that for a long time, and I wanted to hear it. He said, Thank you. I'm glad that preached. He said, Doctor, would you mind if I uh, made a mild statement about the whole thing? Oh, no. He said, Go ahead. He said, Doctor, that was brave truth that you don't have. You're not really. I could tell by the way you preach that you tell. You don't have. And learn the doctor went on his knees for a long month didn't preach. Stop God. He stopped to take that which was objective truth and make it spiritual experience. And the day came when after the dark sufferings in his soul, God had brought him in to his own house. And the flood of the Spirit came in on his life, and he went out to be one of the greatest preachers of his generation. But he had to die to himself. In actual spiritual experience. Now you pray for me, and I'll pray for you. We must follow our Lord in this. Not be satisfied to go out and quote it. Not memorize it. I memorize it. I can quote it from memory. That isn't enough. I know what Paul meant. That isn't enough. This must become living reality to me. Do you agree? Do you want God to do something for you? There is no more I than Christ to live in me. Yes? Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, our branch of healing, our star, yet on his oil shown. We bless thee this morning. We worship thee. 